Welcome to episode 48 of Norse Myths, Legends, and Folktales. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we learn how after 50 years of ruling, Beowulf goes off to fight the dragon that terrorizes his kingdom in Beowulf and the Dragon. Beowulf gave faithful service to Huliark. In peace, he was his wise counselor, and in war, his right-hand battleman. Then did the king fall fighting against the Frisians and the Nus. His death was avenged by Beowulf on the field, for he seized Diherevan, the hero of the Nus, and slew him, not with his sword. I grasped him, the hero could boast. His beating heart I stilled. I crushed his bones. Then swam Beowulf away towards home, escaping unscathed and bearing with him the armor of thirty warriors. Queen Huda mourned the king's death, and to Beowulf made offer of the kingdom, but he chose to be faithful to Huliark and protected his young son Hadarit until he grew to years of wisdom and strength. But the young king was slain by Eilmund, and Beowulf was given the throne. He avenged the death of Hadokrid by slaying his murderer's brother, Eadialis. For fifty winters did Beowulf reign wisely and well. Then a great dragon began to ravage his country with fire. Alone did the monarch combat against it, and in the end was the victor. But he paid life's cost. For his triumph. Now, the dragon had its dwelling in a secret cavern beneath a gray rock on the shoreland of a lonely upland moor. No man knew the path thither. It chanced then that a slave, who had been sorely beaten by his master, fled towards the untrodden solitudes, and he came to the dragon's lair while yet the monster slept. Waking with fear, he beheld there guarding rich treasure, which had been hidden in ancient days by a prince, the last of his race. All his people had fallen in a great war, and he wandered about alone mourning for his friends. Then he hid the treasure of the tribe where the slave found them. Armor and great swords were there, a banner of gold that lit up the cavern, golden cups and many gems and ornaments, collars and brooches, the work of giants in the ancient times. The ancient dragon, which went forth by night, wrapped in fiery flame, found the treasure unprotected, and from that hour became the guardian of it. Now, the slave who discovered the monster's lair had more greed than fear in his heart as he gazed upon the hoard. So he went lightly past the dragon's head and seized a rich golden cup and fled away over the rocks. To his master he carried the treasure and thus secured his pardon and goodwill. The dragon soon afterwards awoke. He smelt along the rocks. He saw the footprints of the man on the ground and searched for him angrily. Round about the monster went, but saw no one in that dismal solitude. Hot was the dragon's heart with desire for conflict. Then he returned to the cavern and found that the treasure had been rifled. Great was his wrath thereat, and he panted to be avenged. So waited he for nightfall when he could go forth against mankind. In the thick darkness, the great dragon flew over the land. He vomited coals of fire over many a fair home. The flames made lurid blaze against the sky, and the men were terror-stricken. It seemed that the night flyer was resolved not to leave aught alive, for far and near the countryside blazed before him. Great harm indeed did he accomplish in his fierce hate for the people of Geatland. All night long 
the raging flames swept the land, and far and near they wrought disaster. Not until it was very nigh unto dawn did the dragon cease his vengeful work and take swift departure to its lair. Great faith had he in the security of his hiding place, but his faith proved to be futile. To Beowulf the grievous tidings of the night horrors were sent quickly. His own country dwelling, the gift of the Geats, was smoldering in fire. Sorrow-stricken, indeed, was the brave old king. No greater grief could have befallen him. In deep gloom he sat alone, who was wont to be cheerful, wondering by what offense he had made angry the Almighty, the everlasting Lord. The fire drake had burned up the people's stronghold. The sea skirting land was devastated. Waves washed inland. Beowulf was filled with anger against the monster and resolved to be avenged. So he began to make ready for the combat. He bade the shield of iron be made for him, for a wooden shield would be of no avail against raging fire. Alas, the valiant hero was doomed to come ere long to life's sad end, as was also the serpent fiend who had for so long kept over the secret horde. Beowulf scorned to attack the flying monster with a host of war men. He had no fear of going forth alone, no dread of single combat, nor did he hold the battle powers of the dragon as of high account. Many conflicts and many war fights he had survived unscathed since he, the hero of many frays, had claims Herot and wrestled in combat with Grendel, the hated fiend. Twelve valiant and true war men he selected to go with him against the fire drake. And as he had come to know how its dread vengeance had been stirred up against his people, he took with him also the slave who had rifled the treasure, so that he might be the guide to lead them unto the monster's den. A sorrowful heart was in the poor man, abject and trembling. He showed the way much against his will, to the mound in which was the treasure, while underneath the dragon kept guard. It was on a rocky shoreland where the waves bellowed in unceasing strife. Beowulf sat on the gray cliff, looking over the sea. His hearth comrades were about him, and he spoke to them words of farewell, for he knew that Veard had tied fast the life thread of his web. His soul was sad and restless, and he was ready to go hence. Not long after that his spirit departed the flesh. Of his whole life the king spake, recounting the long service he had accomplished since he was but seven years old, when King Hretel took him from his father and gave him food and pay mindful of his kinship. Of his deeds of valor he spoke, and life's afflictions, and touchingly he told of a father's sorrow when his son was taken from him. Such an one in his old age remembered every morn the lost lad. For another he had no desire. With sorrow he beheld his son's empty home, with deserted wine hall that heard but the moaning winds, for the horsemen and heroes slept in the grave, and no longer was heard the harp's music and the voices of men making merry. Twas thus he spoke to Retal, the king who sorrowed when his son was slain, and avenged not. Abandoning the world, the stricken monarch sought a solitary place in which to end his days. Then spake Beowulf of Huliark, whom he served and did avenge, and his son, whom he avenged also. When yet young, the hero said, I fought many battles, and now when I am old, I seek fame in combat with the dragon. If he but come from his underground dwelling, he must needs, Beowulf told his followers, wear his armor in that last fray. Naked he fought with Grendel, but now 
he must stand against consuming flame. I shall not draw back a foot's space, he said boldly, and with calm demeanor, nor shall I flee before the watcher of treasure. For the rock it shall be as Veer decrees, Veer, who measures out a man's life. Ready am I, and I boast not before the dragon. Ye warriors in armor, watch ye from the mound, so that ye may perceive which of us is best able to survive the strife after deadly attack. It is not for one of you to fight, as I must fight. The adventure is for me only. Gold shall I win for triumph, and death is my due if I fail. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales. Many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.